And now joining us on Book TV in London is Dr. Eric Drexler, who has written a book called Radical Abundance, How a Revolution in Nanotechnology Will Change Civilization. Dr. Drexler, what is nanotechnology? Uh, nanotechnology at present means a number of different things. Uh, the concept, when I introduced it in 1986, focused on small machines uh, able to do manufacturing operations, starting with molecular building blocks, combining them to make larger pieces, larger pieces, and finally, atomically precise products. I'm currently using the unambiguous term atomically precise manufacturing. APM is APM how you is. refer to it in the book. If you introduced you this term in 1986, why are you just writing about it in 2013? Again. Well, uh, a lot has happened um, since the last book that I wrote, which was actually a very thick technical book based on my MIT dissertation. Uh, this book will be much more accessible. Uh, it is, I'm told. But a lot has happened since then. Since then, we've seen the launch of multi-billion dollar research programs around the world under the umbrella of nanotechnology. Uh, the emergence of nanotechnology as an idea in popular culture, which has gone off in all sorts of peculiar and confusing directions. And the rise of an atomically precise fabrication technology base that has gone much further than people think and will, I think, lead to surprising progress when people start putting the pieces together to actually focus on atomically precise manufacturing, on technologies on the path what, to that capability. What do you mean by progress? Uh, by that, I mean moving through a succession of generations of tools. If you look at computers, we've had Moore's Law progress, generation after generation of computational systems. In this case, the prospect is of rather different technologies initially that lay a groundwork for the later stages. Uh, today, people are able to make small molecules with atomic precision. That's been done for 100 years. That has scaled up over the decades from making a dozen atoms in a precise arrangement to making millions in a precise arrangement, very recent development. And building on that, we see the ability to make devices, machines, systems, tools. Think of, think of manufacturing today. If you go into a factory, you find a lot of machines. And where do the machines come from? Well, they're built by other machines. Where did those machines come from? Well, they were built by earlier machines, and if you trace back and back, we're sort of looking at the branches, the leaves of a tree of technology. And if you go back through the branches, you find at the core the machines that make the machines that make the machines, the precision machines. And if you trace that back through the generations, you'd find a blacksmith hammering away, making tools that are somewhat better, and passing them on to his son. That same path of using tools to build better tools is something that is emerging in the nanoscale molecular world and it can go comparably far through something that parallels the Industrial Revolution in making manufacturing systems that work surprisingly much like the ones we're familiar with, but on a far smaller scale and in some ways parallel to digital logic. What is digital logic? Well, inside computers, well, for first to contrast, go back a few decades, you find telephones where the signals were sent by voltages and currents that would, would vary. And you'd have a telephone and you'd have a television and a radio, and, uh, and someplace else you would have uh, uh, you know, movie cameras and dark rooms and all these sorts of, of devices. Today, we have digital logic systems, the things that you find in a computer, handle bits and bytes with precision, arranging patterns, that are then brought out uh, into patterns of pixels on screens, signals that control machines, and so on. And the amazing power of that technology is its ability to work with the smallest bits of information at in enormous speeds, billions of cycles per second, to make complex patterns. That's something that didn't exist before computers, which now have their components down at the nanoscale, nearly the molecular scale, through decades of progress in Moore's Law. And the prospect is of a similar transformation, again based on nanoscale devices, very high frequencies, working not with bits and bytes, but with atoms and molecules to make complex patterns. Not pixels on a screen, but three-dimensional useful objects. Well, Dr. Drexler, in Radical Abundance, you give the potentially practical example of uh, a car manufacturer mm -hmm. building a car in a mm -hmm. factory the size of a garage. How, mm -hmm. how does that happen? And is that our future? 
uh, not around the corner, but again, after a series of developments. So it's a, one shouldn't confuse a, a clear sight with a short distance. We have that, that clear sight at present. Uh, but the processes, uh, well, I think again, it's, it's useful to, to work backward. In a modern automobile factory, you see large components and they're put together by largely, at this point, automated processes to make a full-scale automobile. You take those components, the engine perhaps, well, trace backward, where did that come from? Well, it was put together from smaller parts. And if you trace back further, you find that those parts were put together from smaller parts until finally you get to some smallest units that are, that are made by assembly. In an atomically precise manufacturing process, you'd find a similar process of parts being put together, but you'd be able to trace it much further. You'd find that at a smaller scale, you'd have microscopic parts put together to make visible parts. And beyond that, submicroscopic parts, all the way down to molecular building blocks. And the surprising fact is that those processes can be very similar, machines moving things around, putting parts together, remarkably conventional, like a factory floor, you know, conveyor belts and gears and pulleys and, and, and swinging parts, uh, almost, almost absurdly familiar, almost absurdly comprehensible, very easy to understand once one gets it in focus. And so that's one surprise. The other surprise is the process can be fast and uh, efficient and very productive. Eric Drexler, where does 3D printing fit into your, into your progression scale? Uh, 3D printing is perhaps the best analogy in, in some sense for this technology. If you look at uh, well, the, the, the prospect is to be able to make you know, among other things, a factory that might be like a desktop printer, larger to make a car, smaller to make uh, household goods or, or such. 3D printers take digital information and put down little, little bits, in the, the home versions, little bits of plastic, and build up layer by layer three-dimensional objects, some of which are, are uh, actually useful and functional. Uh, the prospect here is, again, of digital information, putting together small parts to make three-dimensional objects in a box that's not enormously larger than the product itself. So that's very power, uh, very parallel. Uh, the nature of the products, on the other hand, can be very different. Uh, the, I, I named the book Radical Abundance, and I think it's useful to think of radical in two terms, two, two, the, the term radical in two senses. Uh, one is a radical expansion of the range of products that can be made in terms of performance, uh, efficiency, uh, uh, applications. And the other one is a radical reduction in the cost. And by cost, I mean that in every sense of the word. Uh, labor cost, materials, energy, and also the costs associated with environmental impact. This is a technology that lends itself to production with a zero carbon footprint and production of vehicles and other products that themselves have a zero carbon footprint. And even an economics of energy and other required devices that opens the prospect of being able to do what I think there is no other prospect of accomplishing, which is actually reversing the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and rolling back the causes of global warming. What is the NNI? Uh, the NNI is the National Nanotechnology uh, Initiative, which coordinates funding across the, across the US government. There are parallel organizations in other countries. And the NNI was launched in the year 2000. That was when Congress voted, and has scaled up to about a billion dollars per year of government funding, which is matched by comparable or larger amounts of, of uh, of corporate funding. However, the vision that drove the excitement that led to Congress funding this program was a vision of atomically precise manufacturing. And if you go to the NNI website, what you find is that most of the research is centered on what, broadly speaking, very diverse, many areas, many applications, uh, but it centers on nanomaterials. So when the idea of atomically precise manufacturing captured the public imagination and the scientific imagination, the prospect was of building from the bottom up with nanoscale machines that themselves would be built by nanoscale machines, again, tools building tools. 
But many scientists said, oh, uh, we're working with atoms and molecules, as chemists have done 